This video is brought to you by True Tales of Buried Treasure, the largest collection of old treasure magazines in the West. On our website, you can search for individual treasure stories by region or buy our original magazines themselves. To pay us a visit, please click on the link in the description. Enjoy. From within the hidden depths of verdant foliage, a pair of unwavering eyes observe the advancing carriage on the Lemhi Valley Road in northeastern Idaho. With its southward trajectory, the vehicle appeared to be a modest two-seater buckboard crowned with a sturdy roof. Three teams of horses were harnessed to this peculiar contraption, with two men occupying the front seat alongside the driver and two more nestled behind them. Curiosity peaked. The vigilant observers scrutinized the buckboard, their bodies frozen to the earth as the conveyance drew near. It was evident that this stagecoach was in a frenetic hurry, driven by some pressing purpose. What could possibly warrant the utilization of three horse teams for such a seemingly lightweight load? Typically, a single team would suffice, or at most two when the roads were muddy. Perplexed, the hidden pair exchanged a knowing glance, their attention captivated. Good heavens, one of them exclaimed. It must be gold from the Salmon River mines. In an instant, they sprang to their feet and retreated to a small glade where their horses patiently grazed. Swiftly tightening the saddle cinches, they mounted their trusty steeds and veered off the road, skillfully concealed by nature's embrace. As the sound of the approaching stagecoach grew louder, their impromptu plan took shape, driven by a newfound determination. Racing forward, their singular focus centered on seizing the precious cargo at gunpoint. Arriving at Birch Creek, near the present-day Lone Pine, they followed its course downstream towards the crossing. Here, the creek sprawled wide, its current meandering merely ankle-deep. Each man positioned himself on one side of the narrow road, after cleverly concealing their horses amidst the brush that lined the creek. Crouched in anticipation, they fingered their trusty six-shooters, rifles within easy reach. Their minds danced with visions of a swift and effortless acquisition of immense wealth. Alas, no prepared pathway awaited them at the ford. The gravelly banks sloped gently into the shallow stream. Merely ten minutes had elapsed since assuming their positions when the telltale sound of the nearing stagecoach reached their ears. The stagecoach emerged from the distance, its pace slowing as it approached the creek. With a gentle descent, it ventured into the shallow waters, proceeding at a leisurely walk. As the horses reached the level ground, the two assailants rose, their faces exposed but armed with deadly six-shooters. One false move and you'll meet your demise, one of them shouted, while the other called from the opposite side. If he doesn't get you, I surely will. The driver, gripping the leather reins tightly, pulled back to bring the stagecoach to a halt. Unfazed by the situation, he confidently declared, All right, gentlemen, you won't find anything of value this time. We're merely transporting mail sacks, unlikely to hold any treasures. Perhaps not, but what about those boxes beneath the sacks? One of the bandits retorted suspiciously. Your setup seems rather dubious, driver. You don't need six horses to carry mail sacks. We'll have a peek inside those boxes, and maybe your passengers are carrying hefty purses. You on the back seat, the partner commanded. Toss down those boxes at your feet. The passengers appeared to comply with the order, but chaos erupted in an instant. A low command was given, and all four passengers swiftly brandished pistols, spewing flames and bullets. Their rapid response proved fatal. The bandits on both sides of the road had already taken aim, unleashing a barrage of bullets upon the stagecoach. With their revolvers emptied, the assailants fell, replaced by carbine rifles. In the initial exchange of gunfire, two passengers fell victim to the violence while the driver and the remaining two were wounded. Startled by the gunfire and the driver inadvertently releasing the brake, the horses bolted forward, propelling the stagecoach into a frenzied escape. Gaining a hundred yards with the occupants no longer shooting back, the stage almost got away. But two accurate rifle shots dropped the leader stone dead. The two teams piled up on them, breaking out the tongue to which the forward chains were fastened. The buckboard smashed over on the right side spilling cargo, dead bodies, and the wounded men. The latter leaped up and took off running down the road. Breaking off shooting, the bandits watched the men disappear over a far rise. In no hurry, and calling laughingly to each other, 
They got their horses and rode to the piled up wreckage. Three heavy wooden boxes had been thrown out with the mail sacks. When broken open with rocks, they were found to contain gold bars. Most of the bars were stamped with the name of a mining company. The bullion might have been shipped down the Gilmore and Pittsburgh short line railroad running between Salmon City and Gilmore. This was often done with the shipment picked up in Gilmore by stage and carried quickly south to Idaho Falls for transshipment. Elated over their Golden Hall, the bandits turned their attention to the dead bodies. But there was no gold dust on either. They were not miners but armed guards accompanying the bullion shipment. The discovery astonished the bandits. Now they understood why De Parada resistance had been made. The bullion had been guarded by four men because it ran into a huge sum of money. The bandits paid no attention to the wounded horses still threshing about the wreckage. Less concern was given to the fleeing men. They knew the wounded trio would have a mighty long walk to the stage station at Mud Lake Terradon to get help. The road was quiet as the railroad surrounded it, leaving only a few shipments of gold to be transported by wheels. The bandits, caught up in their exhilaration, believed they had nothing to fear. Little did they know the stolen bullion was valued at a staggering $350,000. The immediate challenge was how to transport the heavy gold bars. Realizing two men couldn't carry even one box, they decided to hide their loot. Making multiple trips, they carried a few bars at a time downstream to a wooded area. Taking their time, they searched for a natural depression, concealed the bars, and covered them with soil. They carefully erased their tracks, ensuring no evidence remained. Each bandit kept two gold bars, weighing approximately 20 pounds each, making their saddle horses bear an extra load of 40 pounds. Still under the illusion of having ample time, they proceeded further downstream. As evening approached, they settled by the riverbank, boiling coffee and preparing a meager meal using the last of their supplies. Their main topic of conversation was where to go to hide out until the hue and cry over the robbery abated. Then they would return with pack animals to haul away the rest of the buried loot. What they didn't dream of was the fact that destiny was ganging up on them to cut their careers as bandits abruptly short. The driver and the two surviving guards managed to get about five miles down the road. There, overcome by weakness from loss of blood from their wounds, they fell by the wayside. Then along came a freight train of 10 wagons and trailers belonging to Oscar Hedrick. On finding them, he halted and heard the account of the bloody Rob Berry. A light wagon, used as an auxiliary supply trailer, was cut out, teamed up, and sent down the road to take the wounded men to medical help. Mounting up four of his helpers, Hedrick proceeded to the robbery scene. It was dark then, but the mess in the road was cleared off, and one wounded horse shot as an act of mercy. Hedrick didn't consider trying to overtake the murderous bandits. They'd had plenty of time to flee many miles from the scene. Then one of his men discovered a faint flicker of firelight downstream in the timber. Mounting up again and quickly losing sight of the fire, Hedrick and his men walked their horses downstream. The blaze came into view again with a light wind that had started rising. Dismounting well away, the five slipped close enough to see the crude camp in a glade and two saddled horses. Hedrick couldn't imagine the bandits being in that camp. Only two had been seen at the robbery, but that didn't mean others weren't somewhere out of sight. It could be a large gang. Moving up and keeping behind cover, Hedrick called out, All right, you in camp, identify yourselves. Believing themselves safe from pursuit for many hours at least until sometime the next day, the bandits were startled to say the least. They also lost their caution leaping up from prone positions on the ground to open fire at the sound of Hedrick's voice. Hedrick's widely dispersed comrades retaliated with equal swiftness, returning fire upon the bandits. One of the marauders, with intentions of seeking refuge behind a nearby tree, advanced a few steps but met his demise, pierced by multiple bullets. Sensibly, the other bandit ceased his shooting, so as not to betray his location with the flash of his pistol and made a hasty retreat for cover. The gunfire ceased momentarily, allowing for a brief respite. Hedrick recounted overhearing the surviving bandit tersely call out, Hey Alex, are you all right? Regrettably, no response emanated from his partner. However, Hedrick called out to him, You are encircled. Surrender would be your wisest course of action. A minute or so elapsed before an answer emerged, a flurry of galloping hoofbeats that rapidly receded from the vicinity of the creek. 
Emboldened by this development, the five men cautiously advanced toward the campsite. There they discovered the lifeless body of the fallen bandit, alongside remnants of their meal, a coffee can and skillet. Hedrick and his comrades then tactfully withdrew to the road, carrying the deceased bandit with them. His final resting place lay a short distance away, discreetly concealed from view. The wagon train came to a halt as Hedrick and his comrades ventured down the creek the following morning. Their curiosity peaked. To their relief, the tracks revealed the presence of only two bandits. Hedrick's mind raced as he pondered the whereabouts of the abandoned or buried bullion, confident that the fleeing bandit couldn't have taken it along. Following the tracks diligently, they stumbled upon the deceased bandit's horse downstream, its saddle and bridle still intact. It appeared that the surviving bandit had initially intended to claim the beast, but ultimately set it free. Unperturbed by the escaping bandit's trail, Hedrick focused on unearthing the precious bullion. The mining companies on the brink of losing their fortunes would surely reward handsomely for its recovery. Alas, despite their exhaustive search, not a single clue to the hidden stash came to light. The subsequent day, a small posse arrived from the south, prompting the wagon train to proceed to Gilmore while another group set off for the scene of the robbery. Yet both teams failed in their attempts to track down the elusive bandit, losing his trail amidst the treacherous Beaverhead Mountains. It was suspected that he had crossed over into Montana. Three weeks later, a man of average height, donned in rough minor attire but armed with a cartridge belt and six-shooter, stood at the bar of a Salmon City saloon. Suspicion arose within the bartender as the man handed over a small, jagged piece of gold as payment for his drinks. The bartender discreetly sent a message to the local law enforcement, convinced that the chunk of gold had been crudely hacked from a larger piece. The deputy sheriff arrived, and the swamper pointed out the stranger. With a demeanor that exuded toughness, the stranger caught the attention of the deputy who observed his every move. The stranger then proceeded to another saloon, where he revealed yet another piece of roughly hacked gold. Joined by the town marshal, the deputy trailed the man to the livery barn. They caught up with him beneath the glow of a hanging lantern at the archway. Hold on a moment, sir. We would like to have a word with you, called the deputy. The whiskered man swiftly turned, his right hand inching toward his holstered gun. Yeah, he snarled. The deputy wasted no time. Where did you acquire that gold, he demanded. That's none of your business, you lawmen, snapped the stranger, drawing his pistol and striking the town officer with a grazing shot. However, the stranger never got the chance for a second shot. The deputy swiftly fired two bullets into his abdomen. Dropping his smoking weapon, the man staggered briefly before collapsing unconscious. The livery barn worker rushed out from the ticket booth and aided in carrying the wounded stranger inside. He then hurried off to fetch the doctor. More officers arrived before the doctor who examined the stranger. Shaking his head, the doctor delivered grim news. He doesn't have much time, he remarked. A thorough search of the stranger's pockets yielded several more pieces of gold, all crudely hacked from a larger chunk. The lawman also discovered his saddle roll, which had been concealed beneath hay in the horse's manger. Inside the roll, they found a gold bar bearing the name of a mining company, providing evidence that this was the surviving bandit who had eluded Hedrick and his men at Birch Creek. Interrogated, he was reminded of his dwindling time and pressed for the whereabouts of the remaining bars. With a feeble grin, he replied, buried deep in the earth, the safest place in the world. He adamantly refused to divulge any further details. However, as his life slipped away rapidly, he relented and provided a statement disclosing the robbery's specifics. Yet each word weakened him, and his final mutterings concerned the loot. It's hidden by the creek where my partner met his end, he uttered before passing away. The bandit was laid to rest the following day in the Pioneer Cemetery atop a gentle hill. A team was promptly dispatched to retrieve the bullion, but returned empty-handed after a fortnight. It was presumed that the dying man intentionally misled them about the cache's location. An intriguing aspect of this treasure lies in the mining company's tight-lipped response to their loss. They swiftly enforced a code of silence, refusing to acknowledge any misplacement. No explanation was provided then or in subsequent years. However, the members of Hedrick's wagon train, the stage driver and the surviving guard shared the tale, causing it to circulate throughout the region, only to eventually fade away. The crossing where the robbery occurred is south, 
and a little east of a roadside stop called Lone Pine, which in turn is about two miles north of where Pass Creek runs into Birch Creek. Lone Pine will not be found on road maps, but it shows on forest maps of the Targhee National Forest and is in northern Butte County. But a word of caution to treasure hunters, the old road crossing is on privately owned land. Hence, permission is necessary before you can conduct a search. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to read the original article or purchase the magazine from which it was taken, please check out our website, truetalesofburiedtreasure.com.